Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ask the CEO. Today's topic will be data and AI and fintech, and we are joined by a panel of experts in the financial services industry. Um, welcome. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce myself, and then I'll take it around the room, and everybody uh, will get a chance to introduce themselves. So I'm Avraham Gatile, founder and CEO of Ask the CEO Media, where I help people get heard over the noise on social media with influencer marketing and thought leadership. Helen, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, Abraham. Such a pleasure being here with all of you today. I'm Helen Yu. I'm the founder and CEO of Taigong Advisory Corp. Uh, I'm also a host of CXO Spice. I'm currently sitting on two boards of AI companies. In addition, I'm also the vice chairman for the Global Cybersecurity Association. Great. Uh, Melissa, why don't you go next? Hi, and Abraham, thank you so much uh, for having me. And thank you to uh, to Tyler and, and Helen for, um, for being here. And my name is uh, Dr. Melissa Sassi. Um, I'm a venture partner at Machine Lab Ventures. And we enable startups, scale-ups, and enterprise to gain access to innovation and gain access to revenue markets, all kinds of fun stuff that we'll talk about later. Thank you for having me. Great. Looking forward to hearing all about it. And Tyler. Hi. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited that we have an all-women panel here. Um, my uh, my background is uh, DOD, and currently I am the uh, CEO and co-founder for Dark Kryptonite, which is a revolutionary cybersecurity company. So thank you again for having me. Great. Um, you know, I'm really excited to hear about that. Um, so we'll start off with Helen. Um, Helen, I know you have a lot of interesting experience in fintech and AI. Um, you know, AI is having an impact in every industry, especially in fintech. Um, can you give us a brief overview of your journey into fintech and AI? And then also share with us what trends are you seeing in the market with respect to AI and fintech? Uh, use cases in big and small banks. Yeah, thank you, Avril. So I actually made quite a few pivot with my career, as you already know. The first pivot was from a bean counter to a bean grower. So because I started my career as a financial analyst and accountant, and later on got into uh, the technical realm, where I learned how to code. And then that's where, I mean, my journey with AI and FinTech dated back to the time when I was a solution architect at Oracle. And after working in the corporate world for over 15 years, I pivoted again, right, from a corporate leader to entrepreneur, started my own company about six years ago. So that's when I start, you know, we deployed AI at Global Bank. And uh, then recently I pivoted again to become a creator, uh, got into the influencing marketing world, working with many fortune brands. IBM is one of them, as a matter of fact. Um, and then what I really, you know, when you talk about the trend for FinTech AI, there are so many of them, but let me highlight a few, right? So in today's changing economy, financial institutions are innovating by embracing open business models and embedded fin finance. So to, to succeed in the digital era, uh, institutions must adapt culture models, IT systems and harness potential of generative AI. So this, I call it the era of self-service and the era of AI, when they intersect with each other, it created massive opportunities for FinTech. So in FinTech, I would say AI, you know, free from like free from bias, isn't just a go anymore, it's a fundamental necessity. Bias can distort financial you know, decisions and uh, erode trust to empower a fair, you know, fair, inclusive financial line landscape. We must ensure that AI serves all, regardless of background or circumstance. So um, there are a few other things to highlight here. I talked about embedded finance earlier. You know, it's really crucial for mo for modern banking. As a matter of fact, IBM had a research recently with 70% of executives seeing it as a core or complementary part of their strategy. And the ecosystem-based business models are on the rise 
right? Was 20% of the organization already providing embedded finance solution, but there is a disconnect as a bank executive because they don't fully recognize the value of mobile wallets, personalized rewards or top-notch customer service. So that's where AI can add tremendous amount of value to enhance the customer experience. And then, you know, to create the bank, everyday bank for everybody, no matter where you're at, right? To me, that digital inclusivity is where AI can play a major role in enabling fintech to make to add value to uh, create that inclusive um, banking system, inclusive financial uh, systems for everybody. Yeah, you know, I really like that. And Melissa and I were having a, a sidebar earlier. We were talking about the different different statistics. Um, you know, when it comes to diversity and inclusion and, uh, you know, what you said, Helen, about, um, you know, AI um, uh, being available for all, uh, you know, that really resonates with us. Yeah. One thing I do want to emphasize is the privacy security concern. All of you know, you know, despite of the hype of AI, why you know, a lot of people are still concerned and not moving fast enough? Because, you know, in the open ecosystems, slow, you know, that concern, security and privacy concerns, slowing down the innovation, especially with financial institutions, right? CEOs, and then they are ranking that as a top barrier to deploy AI today. Wow. So, you know, that that's a perfect segue to Melissa. You know, Melissa, you've had a lot of experience, um, you know, working with startups in, in your uh, venture building journey. I know you've been to like a million and one countries. Um, 61, almost a million and one. I, I'm on my way to a million and one. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, can you give us a brief journey, uh, a brief journey of your journey into financial yeah, services? I'll give you a brief journey of my journey. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when everyone was defecting from uh, either either a forced defection or, or by choice from, uh, you know, financial services during the financial crisis, I, I actually dove in. Um, and that's where I got my sea legs, uh, spent uh, kind of a, a number of years with the core team that uh, transitioned uh, GMAC um, to uh, Ally Bank. So I was part of the team that, that built Ally Bank. And it was uh, really interesting that they kind of enabled me to be part of that because I knew nothing about financial services and regulated industries. But um, I, I really had a, a wonderful group of people that showed me the ropes and and kind of set me out, um, you know, to uh, to be on my path of in many ways where I am today, but um, went from there to Goldman, uh, went from Goldman to BlackRock. A lot of those activities were all, for, all um, you know, kind of centered around, um, you know, compliance and, you know, hiring fintechs, even though we didn't necessarily use that word um, back then, or at least I didn't, maybe I was not the cool one. Um, went from there to tech, spent a number of years, um, you know, working in uh, in big tech. And now I've scouted 225 startups in uh, 75 countries raising, you know, founders raising, um, you know, more than 350, 400 million dollars in uh, investment um, capital. So that's kind of been my my journey. And I like to say that I've been on kind of like the venture building side, the accelerator side, the bank side. Um yeah, gives me a big wide view. Awesome. So, so tell us about the role that startup ventures are playing in driving the evolution of financial services, especially where AI comes into the picture. Yeah. So, I think when uh, when Helen spoke about the evolution of uh, financial services, a lot of that's coming from you know your small fintechs, whether it's individuals who have you know identified solutions or problems based on their everyday. Or, you know, by working in a bank, so with, you know, kind of institutional knowledge, if you will, uh, many of those individuals are coming from, you know, non-tech backgrounds in some cases um, and, you know, building tech solutions, recruiting a team, blah, 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 um, and really creating a lot of the solutions that Helen had talked about. You know, one of the things that you mentioned, um, Abraham, was around um, inclusion. And I know Helen spoke about that as well. And forgive me if I'm looking up. I want to make sure I get some of these stats right. Um, but I was reading something this morning and it, you know, I've seen it before, but I wanted to refresh myself on some of the stats. You know, we in the U.S. as women, because uh, I know 
Abraham, you're not a woman, so I'm just saying us women, um, you know, we're only able to open a bank account in like the 70s. I think it was like 1974, if I'm not mistaken. So it really hasn't been that long. Yeah, maybe Helen, you've got, you know, a little bit more history, but that's what I read this morning. So definitely shoot me off the stage if I'm wrong. Um, but, you know, in 2021, there were only 13 women owned bank amongst, you know, I, amongst wow. the tens of thousands of banks that exist. 18% of financial services companies include a C-level woman, you know, in, in that role. 4% are women of color. In 2012, it was 12%. We went from 12% to 18%. Holy smokes. Um, you know, if we think about it, one of the big, you know, pushes is around, you know, women role models. You see where I'm going around fintechs in a second, because I promise I'm getting there. Um, you know, 80% of women-owned businesses lack access to loans and capital. 65% of women have access to a bank account. And I think that comes from the World Bank, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm happy to cite, um, you know, uh, references, you know, if needed. Um, in my opinion, and I think this, this probably goes for the panel, fintech will not only drive economic development, but can power the future of inclusion. And why do I say that? Look at the m of the world that bring about mobile money where a woman no longer has to carry a bag of money with her. She no longer has to get permission from her husband. And maybe not some of that, maybe some of that stuff is not, you know, a reality, you know, for, for many of us in certain parts of the world, it's a reality in other parts. Um, I think it's important when building a venture to have, you know, experience, lived experience. And when you are a woman who lacks access to capital to build your business, and you've got a solution that can solve that and it enables fintech or incorporates fintech, super powerful. So I look forward to more inclusion. I look forward <clears throat> to more startups at the bottom of the pyramid, creating like what M-Pesa has done in Kenya to power women at the bottom of the pyramid. So. Great. Um, you know, Melissa, you mentioned data privacy, and that is uh, Tyler's forte. Um, you know, so Tyler, how does data privacy impact AI in the financial services sector? Well, um, how it is impacted is it's it's can actually help with data privacy or it can actually hurt data privacy. A, a lot of it is just going to depend on um, where, how things are coded and how quickly it's learned. The AI is actually learning. Um, one of the important things though, that I want to just talk about is this idea of data privacy. Um, I've been in this industry for over 20 years. Um, I worked for the Department of Defense Cybercrime Center doing forensics. Um, then I moved to the Defense Intelligence Agency where I was the deputy chief for the Special Communications Office. And special comms is like literally the opposite of forensics. So for people that are going into high risk areas, um, they need for their devices to look and feel like they're supposed to, yet at the same time, be able to operate in and out through hidden channels. And that's really what we need right now, because this concept of data privacy, it's a concept. I'm not sure data privacy exists right now. I think that we're kind of at this point where you know, the internet was not designed to be secure and we're just putting these bandages on a gaping hole that will never be fixed. So what we're, what we're starting to see is things like dark kryptonite, which is a uh, AI powered SaaS platform with an AI closed loop network. So um, I, I kind of like to think about it like, uh, you know, all the cars on the streets, well, they can drive, they can go wherever they want. There's identifying features of them. But compare that to NASCAR, which is a completely closed loop track where the cars from the highway can't get in. Because if you have an IP address and you have a name, everybody knows where you live and they can continue to attack. But when you go underground into a closed loop network, that is constantly changing itself, 
it's very difficult for hackers or really for anyone to be able to find that information. So I do believe the concept of data privacy is act- is real and that we can attain it. I just don't think that we're there right now. And, you know, I believe very strongly in the power of AI. And, you know, I, I see in the next uh, 20 years that AI will actually take over most of the jobs that we have nowadays, including coding for new AI. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, I think AI has a lot of potential to really, really help a lot of people in in the financial services, in health tech, in various different verticals. So I'm kind of excited about the future of AI. And I know that maybe I'm that lone weirdo that actually thinks more AI is actually a good thing. Well, you know, you're definitely not in the weirdo category. Uh you know, AI is here whether we like it or not. And, uh, you know, we now need to leverage that tool because everyone else is using it. And, you know, we either need to um, get with the program or get left behind. So, you know, there's there's definitely an increasing role uh, that I see in AI. Um, you know, Melissa, uh, from a venture building perspective, what could startups be doing to help them improve their ability uh, to meet, you know, the industry risk as well as compliance requirements? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll take this from a, a couple of different perspectives. First perspective I'll take this from is, you know, while, you know, risks are here every single day, I think there are, you know, steps beyond just education um, that, uh, startups or you know any company regardless of size can can deploy um you know there is uh, an event coming up on the 18th of uh, October um and there'll be replays so if you listen to this uh, later than that there are replays available it's called IBM Z day and um for startups specifically um there are a number of different solutions that like IBM for example has you know uh available. Um, One of the, you know, solutions is called IBM HyperProtect Services that many call the Fort Knox of cloud computing. Okay, fine. You know, you are, you know, running, you know, running in the cloud, but you're working on um, kind of a bank grade security where you are, um, your data is encrypted, whether it's at rest, in flight, or in use. And, um, you know, instead of working off of a, you know, kind of traditional cloud solution, you're actually working off of a mainframe. So something that is um, kind of bank grade, if you will. Um, And it's, you know, doesn't necessarily require you to go out and buy a mainframe. Um, So that's the, I think, power of this particular um, solution. And there's an event coming up called IBM Z Day on the 18th, lots of sessions that, um, you know, can engage folks. And so I think in reality, it goes from people got to be educated because if you're not educated, you're not going to know about the solutions that are available. But I think it also goes to tech. Um, you need to implement technology that you know goes beyond just telling everybody what they need to know. Because I think, as Tyler said on a recent um, you know talk um, that I've heard and I was part of, you know we know how that works. It's not working. We have um, yeah. breaches happening all the time, and um, it's getting worse. And it's a scary time. Nobody wants, um, you know, their private information out on the dark web or in the hands of nefarious characters. And nobody wants to be running a company that um, has enabled that, you know, to occur, right. whether you're small or large. That said, um, you know, as a startup, you still got to have policies and procedures, and you still need to be able to sell into you know, large and small financial institutions. And a large bank, for example, is going to have regulatory requirements that they have to meet, which means their vendors have to meet, their fintechs have to meet. And that's around data privacy, data security, what policies and procedures do they have and how are they doing what they do? Um, You know, IBM also has a program called IBM Financial Services Cloud that helps, you know, kind of companies prepare. I could go on and on about a couple of these different things, but um, out of respect for time, IBM Z Day is a great place to learn. And where can people go to sign up for that? Yeah, um, so you can go to ibmc.io slash ask the CEO. 
It yeah. happened right there. Oh, wait, I, I, got this <laughs> I love that URL. Wait, wait, no, that way. Wrong, right? like, yeah, wait, <laughs> that way. That <laughs> way. You know, Zoom has this mirror image uh, thing. That, excuse me. <laughs> every it every single time. <laughs> Awesome. So ibmz.io slash ask the CEO. Great. I'll put that in the show notes and we'll have that up on the screen as well. Super. Um, great. And Melissa, where can people go to connect with you? Yeah. So um, people can connect with me through LinkedIn. I'm easy to find. There is one other Melissa Sassy in the world. Um, and we we kind of have gotten connected just out of fun. Um uh, maybe there are others, so I don't want to misspeak, but LinkedIn, Twitter, I'm easy to find, Instagram. All you got to do is look for Melissa Sassy or Dr. Melissa Sassy, and you're going to find me. Um, you can also learn more about um, Machine Lab Ventures, uh, where I'm a venture partner at mlvp.io. Great. And, you know, maybe one day we'll have both Melissa Sassies on and we'll just blow everyone's mind. I know. There's some and really it will bring digital twins on, too. So then there can be four. <laughs> I, I just want whoever my digital twin is. And maybe if Melissa's open, the other Melissa's open to it. I just want to give her all my work and I just want to go to the beach. So just whoever well, wants to work on that, that's your task. We'll have them all answer the same question to see which one does better. Right, right. I just want to take my dogs with me. Like nobody can have my dogs. My dogs are for me. Um, Helen, how do pe where do people go to connect with you? Well, they can just go find a CXO spies and Google that. Google that. Obviously, they can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, my handle is at you, Helen Yu, or YouTube, uh, CXO Spice YouTube. Um, and then they can uh, easily find uh, where I am. I love that CSO, a CXO Spice. Every time I hear it, it's, it, it's cool. It's spicy. It, it is. It's really cool. You know, spice really means something. S is a scenario, P is point of view, I is innovation, C is CXO is a target audience, E is execution. So it's a platform, like it's spicy. That is, and then <laughs> so it's a platform for thought leaders who share their point of view on innovation and explain how to make it happen in real world. I need to hang out with Helen more often. Yeah, that's yeah, incredible. Um, that's so cool. And, and Tyler, how do people connect with you? Um, on all social media channels, uh, Tyler Cohen Wood um, or darkkryptonite.com. I'm pretty easy to find. Awesome. And I'll post all that in the show notes as well. Okay. Um, all right. Closing question for everybody. So we'll start with Helen. Helen, what is the future of AI in financial services and in fintech in general? Wow, that's a million dollar question here. The spicy um, question. Very <laughs> spicy. It is spicy. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I'm optimistic about the potential of AI, right? I believe it is a pathway for us to reach our potential pathway for freedom for human. Obviously, we all know AI is reshaping fintech, you know, from robot, you know, ro robot advisor for investment to advanced fraud detection. And, you know, most importantly, it can provide the self-service, right? Allows you, you know, the company I sit on board with Pipestream, they provide this self-service for customer services. Honestly, when you on the call today, pick out the phone to call customer service, you cannot tell if you're speaking to a robot or real human anymore. So there are many things. And to me, when when I predict, I, I hope, right, AI can do more good than bad. And then uh, that's not, that's burst the bubble a little bit, right? And they're still in this, in on the planet. And so many people have no access to internet even. Mm -hmm. So uh, and while we're, we are so, we have the privilege accessing everything here. We have to also make sure we leverage AI to uh, create more digital Inclu inclusivity, right? The sustainability. Let's make sure. And then a few things we have to address, right? The ecosystem based model right now are gaining traction. But how do we build a more inclusive ecosystem? Two, when we talk about the important to bridge the gap between customer demand and banking priorities or financial institution priorities, and 
Let's make sure people understand, not just people in the US or Europe, but people in different countries, developing countries, they understand what that is, allow them to have an opportunity to build more opportunity to benefit the broader people, broader network of people. And then we need to modernize the architecture and standardize APIs, right? Not only do that, but do that in a secure way, making sure we address the privacy and security concerns for successful deployment of AI. And AI is just a tool, right? You can't just say, hey, well, I'm going to uh, you know, procure this tool. It's going to work. You have to really define your data strategy. You have to understand, you know, find it the use case that's aligned with your priority. You have to, you know, have the people who understand AI to help you deploy. So it's not just by a, buying a tool, it's how do you use that um, responsibly? And sadly, only 29% of leaders today believe AI is being used or can be used responsibly. So that's a major concern I have. Uh, but that's being said, that's an opportunity, right? Massive opportunities for fintech companies to go there, create a better, more inclusive, sustainable world, leveraging AI, and then leveraging that responsibly. You know, one of the things I love about what you just said, I get asked this all the time, you know, will AI come and take away all our jobs? And, Mm -hmm. you know, essentially, it's going to it's going to take away some of the jobs, you know, all the mundane stuff. But like you said, you still need people that understand AI, that understand technology. You need people that know how to drive the bus, basically. And there will always be opportunities for people in in the way. It's going to create more jobs, right? Create different jobs, different right? Jobs. And future yeah. jobs will be I see shifting. eyebrows raising on Tyler. I just saw one of her eyebrows go like that. I think Tyler's <laughs> like, I can't wait till I get asked this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, well, I do. I, I do believe very strongly in 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 AI, and I think it is eventually going to take over every job, including programming other AI. I think we're about thirty years away from that, but I do believe that that is what will eventually happen, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I really don't. Yeah, and I, you know, I think AI will fight our wars uh, as well. You'll have machines battling machines as well. That sounds uh, much better than the recent turn of events. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. and uh, yes. humans will just be able to sit back, relax, and do fun stuff like art or um, you know things that make people happy. And that sounds like a great future, Melissa. How about you? Yeah, so um, I, I'm not. I I don't know if. Uh, you know, we've reached a point where I can just go chill at the beach with my dogs while the AIs do everything. Um, you know, I, I think a couple things. One, you know, as Helen mentioned, um, you know, less than, you know, less than 50% of people are, you know, connected to the internet as, as Helen, you know, mentioned around internet connectivity, you know, like that's basically half the world doesn't even have access to the internet as we're talking about, you know, AI and and doing away with our jobs. So I think it's really important that we think about all the connectors that drive toward or or snap into where technology is now and where it's going. Mm -hmm. So what do you got to have? You got to have internet access. What else do you have to have? You have to have skills. And with 30%, like just in the US, and I know that's not a, you know, uh, a, a total representation of everyone in the world, but it'll give you an example you know, 30% of the tech workforce in the U.S., and it might even be less than that. I think last time I saw it was like 28 or something like that. So I'm, you know, kind of averaging or, you know, rounding up, if you will. Um, our, you know, tech workers are, you know, women. And if you're, and less than that in terms of uh, people of color. And so if you think about who's going out and developing solutions, who's going out and creating algorithms that are applicable or relevant for, everyone you know so we have to think about who's able to use stuff who's able to build stuff and who's it being built you know for so i think as long as we can solve some of those things i think um you know we'll have a a better future a brighter future where we don't have a situation of the haves and the have nots because if you think about it as we as we go toward a world without internet access without digital skills it's, it's a scary place, right? So that's my doom and gloom. All right, I'm done with doom and gloom now. Let me talk about, you know, kind of the bright future. 
Um, you know, I think that from a fintech perspective, we're going to see more and more automation in, you know, non-traditional areas. I think um, we've already gotten to the point where, you know, banks um, are partnering together, um, you know, with fintechs and recognize that it isn't a us versus them mentality. And I think that goes for, you know, for big banks as well as small banks. Mm -hmm. Um I think, you know, your kind of community regional banks, they, you know, kind of struggle more with gaining access to the budget necessary to completely make, you know, to completely make that that digital transformation, you know, if you will. Um, I think we're going to see more and more digital asset crypto, you know, kind of solutions, Web3 solutions that really turn um you know, finance on its head, whether that's, you know, looking at how things are transacted, how things are done. I'll, I'm not going to go to the gloom, uh, the doom and gloom of that, but I uh, I look forward to a, a future um, that involves me at the beach and an AI doing my work, as long as that doesn't create existential risk, as Elon Musk might say. <laughs> I'm all for that. Me too. Um, so... Helen, Melissa, Tyler, thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you in a few more days on October 18th at IBM. Oh, yeah, Helen, okay. you're speaking. Uh, exactly. Me too. You know, don't forget to say thank you and please to AI when you interact with it, because you just never know. They, they have good memories. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, really I'd be good. your boss one day. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be nicer when I speak to chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Watson. How about Watson? Or Watson, yeah. or Watson <laughs> yes. yes. Or Watson. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much. And I really enjoyed having you on the show. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye.